Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor for us to have in, uh, Dr. Roger Acevedo uh, here at the seminar of the Living Lab and Data Hub from the Institute for the Future of Education. Uh, today, he's going to give us a, a lecture on multimodal learning analytics for self-regulating learning challenges and opportunities. Professor Acevedo uh, is uh, the head of the uh, learning uh, laboratory for the study of intercommission and advanced learning technologies at the University of Central Florida. Uh, and he will be uh, presenting the work uh, he has been developed with his group in, in this in this uh, laboratory, in this prestigious laboratory, that is one of the more iconic uh, places for doing learning analytics in, in the whole world. Uh, and I, I, I'm talking based on, on the scientific we observe in Scopus databases. So uh, uh, he's well positioned in this, in this area. So it's a great uh, pleasure to have you here. Uh, and, and please uh, go ahead, we will have a, Questions on the chat, and if uh, and I will let you know when something is going on. Uh, and at the end, we will have uh, the time for questions and, and answers. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ceballos and uh, and Garza for inviting me to uh, to be with you the, this morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning and to have the opportunity to present to you some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, so, like you said, we're going to focus a little bit on multimodal learning analytics for self-regulated learning, because self-regulated learning is a theoretical framework that we tend to use. And then talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities. And uh, a lot of the work that we do is funded, uh, heavily funded by uh, federal uh, funds from both the US and when I was at McGill, from also from uh, Canada. And also we've been recently getting a lot of funding from the Europeans, uh, so Jacobs Foundation, and also the early uh, consortium. So uh, I'd like to provide a little bit of an overview. So talk a little bit about the science of learning with technology, focusing really on self-regulated learning, the role of multimodal learning analytics, and then exemplify some of the opportunities and challenges that we have by exemplifying that with some current projects that we have in terms of focusing on the theoretical advances, but mostly the methodology and the analytical advances and the issues. And then what are the challenges and opportunities and lessons learned that we have uh, uh, at least experienced? So to kind of provide a, a brief overview in terms of measuring. So when we think about multimodal learning analytics, we take it from a, a self-regulated learning perspective in that there's the issue of, can we detect self-regulation? How do we model self-regulation? How do we track self-regulation? And then can we use that to actually make systems more intelligent uh, so either through the presentation of learning analytics or some other interventions. So uh, broadly speaking, we work across many different learning technologies, and I'll show you that in the next slide. But we always start off with some theory or model or framework of self-regulation. Then we try to understand and measure self-regulation in terms of understanding how self-regulation impacts uh, and the use of using and learning and performing with certain learning technologies. And then really is the measurements of self-regulation both prior to, today we're gonna to be focused on during, so not self-reports, but the actual measurement of self-regulation during learning, et cetera. Uh, so it's reasoning, problem solving and performance and many other uh, techniques. And then really the analysis of the multimodal data is really the focus in terms of what do we do with this data, right? How do we collect this data? What do we do with this data? What inferences, so as a psychologist, I'm very, very much concerned about the accurate detection and also the inferences that we make about these uh, processes, whether it's log file, eye tracking, et cetera. And then how do we make these more intelligent and adaptive instructional interventions? And this could be things like, you know, what is a teacher dashboard? What is a dashboard for a student? What data should it present, et cetera? And then of course that helps us redefine our, our models and theories. So this is almost like a cyclical model uh, we try to use that uh, as a generic model across all the humans we study and whether they're using artificial agents or not and different tasks, domains, and contexts. And I'll exemplify all of these with some of the uh, projects that we have right now. Uh, in terms of the challenges, in fact, I was part of a, a panel uh, on the future of learning analytics at the LAC conference two weeks ago. 
with uh, George Simmons and Rebecca Ferguson, who she is um, the editor of JLA. And I guess some of the things that came to mind is the challenge of multimodal data, right? This is a uh, by recent chapter by Chango and colleagues. These are some of the colleagues uh, in the uh, in University of Oviedo in Spain that just came out. But we're looking, looking at a lot is we have lots of data, different types of data, mostly human institutional data, data visualizations, right? But I think learning analytics still and, and the applications for multimodal learning analytics is still it's very applied field, right? It, it, dealing with specific challenges, educational challenges, training challenges, and those are really important, right? But I think we're also at this stage where we are describing a lot of what these processes are, and there's very limited prediction, right? So what we want is, can we predict over time, right? And how much can we predict into the future? Because really, if we're talking about adaptation, that's how humans should be adapting, right? So it raises several questions. These are just a few of the questions it raises, data analysis, what are the constructs? So when people talk about learning, well, how do we, what does multimodal data of learning look like? Is a different performance, the data quality? How do we synchronize the different types of data? For example, whether it's coming from a physical space, a physiological, psychological, how do we make inferences? How do we fuse the data together? Which features do we extract that are representative of these constructs? Automation, et cetera. Methodologically, how do, I, how do we automate this? How can we be very predictive? What are the statistical and, and machine learning techniques that we're using for making predictions and replicability? Practical issues that we deal with. Can we put sensors in classrooms? In some cases we can, right? Um, the cost of the sensors are sometimes very uh, you know, expensive for some of the stakeholders that we have. And then of course, not to uh, forget about the ethical challenge, privacy, bias, equality, fairness, et cetera. And here in the US, we're obviously very sensitive to that, especially given you know, racial tensions that we have, social economics uh, issues that we have, uh, and other systemic uh, challenges that we face here in the United States. So those are some of the challenges. Uh, however, now I kind of want to just give you a little bit of a sample of some of the environments that we deal with, where we collect learning analytics data, right, multimodal data. So we do everything from intelligent tutoring systems like MetaTutor, where students are learning about biology, and they're instrumented in the lab. Uh, we also have serious games. This is work that we do with middle school and high school and college kids. Here's completely different. Here we talk about agency. Here the students are learning about microbiology and scientific reasoning. We uh, are starting, we started and continue to work in vir virtual reality in schools. In fact, next week we're starting a new study on chemistry and VR with middle school and high school, and also the teachers in terms of uh, psychomotor activities such as like, how do you do pipettes? How do you do titration? Um, and then, so, but these are still very traditional technologies. And then what we're exploring also is some new technologies. I mean, not new that they haven't been around, but it really challenges the multimodal data that we collect and the inferences we make. So for example, tangible computing, here there's a model of uh, the weather, the inundation of the coastal city. So you have water basically represented and we're testing things like, you know, what can an EEG that she's wearing tell us about cognitive workload? What, you know, can the eye tracking of this particular student who's collaborative problem solving with her talk about how he is handling the situation? And then they both have physiological devices. So are there synchronicity, right? In terms of the physiological devices. And if there is no synchronicity, what does that mean about actually being able to collaborate? Right? And of course, what's missing here represented is the dialogue that is going back and forth. How do we capture that dialogue in real time? What inferences can we make? So there's a lot of multimodal data potentially. Um, same thing here with the virtual reality, right? Uh, whether, you know, it's a, here's a smaller version of the tangible landscape, right? Uh, but you can use a pointer. And if you use a pointer, just a regular pointer, like you use in, in, the, in the old days when we had conferences and we didn't have COVID and Zoom, uh, you can actually project. So if I, if I point to this particular point in time, this is what I would see in my VR. So it can have the students transverse the, the, you know, the forest. What am I gonna be learning? And then of course, also for medical education. Uh, we are very active here in the School of Malin and Sam in terms of College of Medicine and our College of Nursing. And the idea is, can we use augmented reality to basically look, do team training uh, of uh, physicians, residents, medical students, et cetera. And patients. So this is uh, some of the context. Each of these contexts presents a, a particular challenge. And so 
So that's the context. And we have to be very sensitive to context, right? And when we're doing multimodal learning analytics, the other question that we have is we have many, 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 many theories, even with self-regulation. This is just a sample, right? So we, if we focus on cognition, metacognition, we tend to use this one here, which is the Winnie and Hadwin model, right? That focuses on cognitive metacognitive strategies. But in some cases, right, we need to collect also motivation data. So we could focus on Zimmerman and Chunk's work. You know, this is more of a Bandura type work. Uh, in some cases, emotions are important, whether it's because it's children or adults or physicians or patients. So we need to look at emotions. So we can use the, the Mello and Gracer model, but also the emotion regulation model, which is even more specific. So for example, if we wanted to collect data on someone's, you know, appraisal system of their emotions, what learning analytics data should we be collecting? And what does that look like, right? And then here's a, a, another model of emotions. So, you know, we, we try to integrate cognition, affect, metacognition, motivation, and sometimes social processes, depending. So we have a lot of theories. Question is, what do these theories say about which constructs we should be looking at, right? And then how do we translate the constructs to the multimodal data we're collecting? And does each data channel actually reflect one of these processes embedded in these models. In some of the context to show you the kinds of data that we collect, typically in the laboratory, this is what an instrumented student would look like or human, right? So we collect physiological data, we collect keystroke data, mouse data. Uh, here they're using Crystal Islands. So uh, the learner agent dialogue we collect, eye tracking data we can collect, and it's right here. Uh, we also do the for screen capture, right? And then here's your very cheap, you know, Logitech camera to do uh, affect, you know, we collect the facial expressions of emotions. The only thing that's missing here is that we can also, depending on the context, is collect the concurrent thing a lot protocol. So this is in the lab where we have ultimate control and collect all this multimodal data, right? However, sometimes then we have to make decisions in the classroom, right? It would not make sense to collect most of this data, right? Because of the cost, but also the interference. So the question becomes, which subset of these data can we collect in a classroom, right? Can we collect, here's a kid, right? Doing the VR system. This is a kid who's been pulled out of the classroom. So we have a classroom where it's just dedicated to collecting her data. So we can have the embedded eye tracker in the VR headset. We're doing motion data from the, from the, from the handset. And then the other interesting thing in this laptop is that we can get the output of what the student is doing. So for example, you could potentially have a teacher or peers watching how the student is solving this problem of photosynthesis and making comments or engaging in pedagogical interactions. One of the new things that we're doing also with an NSF grant is here's a teacher uh, and she's being presented with actually her students' multimodal data. So we're interested in how the teachers interpret multimodal data of their students while collecting multimodal data on them. Okay. And then, of course, we also sometimes uh, we do high fidelity mannequins, especially end of life scenarios where we look at multimodal data and team performance. And this is a very high uh, anxiety and stressful situation. Okay, so we, we can also, so one of the big challenges is how do we take our multimodal tool set, if you will, and then apply it to different contexts, real world and laboratory contexts and everything in between. So here's an example of some of the data that we collect. So this is a data, you see in real uh, eye tracking data of a college student, right? This is a, so we can see their reading patterns, right? But the question from a multimodal perspective is, should we be showing the student their eye tracking data in real time, right? Of course, that would be annoying initially. It could be disruptive also. But would could we enhance our metacognitive monitoring skills if we actually, if you actually, you are the student and you got to see this? Or what are the implications for how do we take this data, this video clip that I'm showing, very short video clip, how do we turn that into a data visualization, right? That could potentially help a student understand why they still don't know the differences between bacteria and viruses, right? And this is just eye tracking data, right? Here's another example. Uh, here is an example of a study with medical students and, and residents and radiologists, uh, excuse me, and um, physicians and residents. And here's live eye tracking data. I get to see their mouse movement. The mouse is right there right now. Okay. And then the bottom you see is there are different emotions, everything from anger, contempt, joy, sadness, surprise. 
based on the camera. So the question is, yeah, we can collect multimodal data. And of course we have the screen recording. Here we can see how they're reading, right? In terms of their eye tracking, all right? So the question is, here's at least three sets of data. You got eye tracking, actually four mouse clicks or mouse uh, movements, screen recording and facial expressions of emotion. The question for us is which of these data channels, right? From a multimodal perspective make are indicative of diagnostic errors, right? Because this is medicine of performance, clinical reasoning, et cetera, right? And then the question is, how do we take this data and can we re-represent this multimodal data in terms of learning analytics? And what do we give back to the, to the medical faculty? What do we give back to the students so that they can enhance and learn about their uh, processes? Okay, so that's another one. Here's another one with MetaTutor, okay? Here, here you, you're so going to see multiple agents okay. come up. This is an environment for self-regulation. You get to see the student's face, and then you also get to see their eye tracking. And their eye tracking here is going to be in red. And the bigger the diameter, the longer the fixation. And you get to see their behavior. And of course, we annotated this video. So how about we learn about uh, what are the effects of smoking? So he's writing, he's setting up a sub goal to drive his learning. So of course, it's that semblance of intelligence, right? You you give the student agency, write the goal, and then of course that goal has to fit within the parameters of the AI, right? So in this case, the student is very compliant. Uh, okay. Wonderful. We've just set up a good sub goal. So now he's got the overall learning goal. He can reflect to all the time. He's got to set up goals, and then we don't tell the student. He has to open the table of contents so that behaviorally we can detect what he selected and for how long he selected, right? Um, <clears throat> so he's looking at the subtopics mm -hmm. and then he's gonna commit to one. How about we learn about the immune system? And if, I don't know if you noticed that very subtly for the eye tracking, he's sampling, right? He looked at the, like a good reader, right? You're supposed to be looking at a subheading. Is this relevant to my sub goal? And then he sampled and now, other aspects of the secret system, immune system. So now he's committed to system, reading. We can see him read. Molecules and organs that are coordinate. Different, different body organs and pathogens. And he's going to use a strategy. He's going to open the notebook. The immune system is a. And we can tell if he's copying or if he's re paraphrasing or summarizing. Okay. And this goes on, right? So what we as scientists collect in terms of multimodal data, the question is, imagine you being the student and you, after you're done with learning your learning session, performance, et cetera, you get this video that we as scientists use, right? You're showing you your multimodal data. Is this the kind of video? Because which student gets this kind of, it's almost like your learning analysis. You get to see what you did. And maybe it can be annotated also with what you did right or correctly or incorrectly, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So I think there's a lot of potential of showing these kinds of data representations as a new way of thinking about multimodal learning analytics, right? Not just, you know, histograms, et cetera. And so what I want to show you here is that we're getting to the point where, you know, as we build these AI systems, right? Uh, we don't really know what pedagogical strategies based on the multimodal data, right? Let's say you have a student who has poor uh, metacognitive skills, no cognitive strategies, uh, poor mo motivation in terms of they have no value, they see no value in learning this material, They're, and then emotions, right? They don't know how to regulate their emotions. So we wanna do is, in this video, what I wanted to show you is, so Michelle here is representing a typical student, right? She's instrumented. She's got the electrodermal activity bracelet here. Uh, we, you're gonna see her eye tracking, et cetera. And then of course, there's a physical barrier. Uh, what Nick is representing here is we now want to understand how the, Nick could represent the researcher. So one of us could represent the teacher, the trainer, really anyone. What we wanna do is he's also instrumented. And what we've done here is Right. So ideally, of course, they would not be in the same room. Uh, this is just for, for demonstration, 
is that we want to study how any of these people, either him as a researcher, teacher, or trainer, right? What is his multimodal data as he is making inferences about her real-time multimodal data? Because if we knew that, then we can make systems even more intelligent. Okay, so I just want to show you this brief clip. And again, I apologize. This is this is done in the lab, so it's this is not you know Hollywood. Okay. As you can tell, they're not very thrilled to see their face. Look at that. Look at that face. Right. So she's looking crystal eye. You can see the eye tracking in real time here in the video. Her selection. Right. And then if we pan to Nick, right? So he's got access. All, we give him all the access to her multimodal data. Right. Because if he was a teacher, then we could also collect data on what intervention would you give? And is it based on the eye tracking data? Is it based on her physiological data? Or screen recording, etc., and those are things that we need to understand to make systems more intelligent. Right, so that's one of the avenues that we're currently pursuing. Um, and then, to give you an example of that, we actually created a prototype system, right, to show you what Nick was doing. Here's an example. So, in this video, I want to show you is so Liz. We did this prior to moving here. Liz is so. Imagine this is from the perspective of a teacher. I am a teacher or a trainer right, or researcher, but mostly teacher or trainer, looking at the interface. I have the student's face, right? I have been trained on cognition, cognition and motions. I have, and then at the bottom here, I, at any point in time, can fire off a pedagogical strategy, right? But what we're doing is we're studying the trainer and the teacher, right? So imagine I'm looking at Liz. Oh, she looks confused. So imagine I, I go over here and I click on confusion. I have access to her data in real time, eye tracking, her mouse movements, et cetera. If I see a metacognitive process, I click on, let's say, uh, she made a judgment of learning, right? If, oops, sorry, hold on a second. And then at some point in time, I can actually then send her a message, which she will receive to intervene pedagogically, right? So in other words, we have the multimodal data, but like, do we really know what to do with this multimodal learning analytics data? Okay. So this is uh, another project that we would love to continue working on. Uh, in terms of uh, an actual grant that we have, so we wanted to train, uh, so we have colleagues in computer science and STEM at North Carolina State University. So we wanted to take your regular environment classroom, right, which has very, you know, unintelligent walls, it's got your you know, projector, et cetera. The question is, if each kid was using some kind of technology that you could potentially use now, whether it's a game or intelligent tutoring system or a MOOC, et cetera, is for each kid, if they're using one of those systems, we can make the system intelligent. So let's say in this case, the kids are getting individualized instruction and feedback because they're using an ITS. But the question is, when we're collecting so much data at the student level, we ask the question of, what in terms of a multimodal learning analytics is what should the teacher dashboard look like? What data should be presented to the teacher? How should it be presented to the teacher? When should it be presented to the teacher? And if we knew that, then what we wanna do is part of our project is let's instrument the teacher. In this case, she has an EEG, eye tracker. She potentially would have an EDA and a camera and a voice because now, you, the teacher, asked for all this kind of data. We're going to instrument you because in real time, the question is, what data do you attend to? What inferences do you make, right? And then how does this complete the instructional? How do you intervene instructionally, right? So it's almost like treating the teacher uh, as a learning analytics data scientist, okay? So that's kind of one of the projects we have now that's NSF uh, because it could be that at some point in time, you know, I need to look at a particular student because this particular student, for example, may have a specific issue with her affect. It, it could be that this student, right, keeps copying information. She's not engaging in, in higher order cognitive strategies. Or this student is actually, in terms of learning trajectory, she's way off, right? So the question is, all right, we'll give you that data. What are you going to do with it? 
Okay. Another project that we have now in terms of multimodal is with colleagues in, um, in Turkey, uh, Israel, uh, Finland, and, and Germany is how, what are the challenges of doing multimodal learning analytics when we have an immersive environment for teachers? So thinking about the classroom of the future, right? What data can we collect as teachers, for example, are creating a lesson plan? The classroom of the future where there may be a physical teacher and physical students present, but there might be students who are basically virtually joining us. Right. What data should be we collecting on this kind of educational context? What data makes sense to collect to understand the ecology and the performance and the learning? Right. And then at the same time, right, thinking about planning, imagine in the future where we have teachers are physically present and perhaps even involved right through their avatars. How are they creating a lesson plan for, let's say, environmental science, right? And use this example because we have NASA here around the corner, and they're very interested in that. And then imagine in the near future is you could have, let's say, it could be the students, right, and the teachers, right? They're looking at the data analytics of the multimodal data that was collected from them or by them about their teachers and their students, okay? So kind of thinking about what would an extended reality for collaboration between teachers and students and researchers look like in the future. Uh, this is a, a three-year project, a two-year project, excuse me, that was funded by early. Uh, the other thing that we've been talking about that I wanted to share with you is that we've also been working with this company called Verbella. Uh, they've kind of taken over and I mean, they're doing a lot of conferences, et cetera. But the question is, imagine you're a college student, uh, you could be a hospital worker, you could be, let's say, a 10th grade student, it's 10 o'clock at night, your parents are sleeping, your teacher, you're not in school, you're having problems, let's say, with your physics problems. Well, how about I jump into, we had a virtual campus where I can jump on the virtual campus, I can present the problems I'm having with the physics problems, okay, to an artificial agent who then guides me to a metacognitive room, right, where I'm surrounded by metacognition in terms of the knowledge, the regulation, et cetera, right? And here I can actually train the students, right? In terms of how to use the metacognitive processes for learning and performing and successfully solving those physics problems. So the question is what would be contained in that metacognitive virtual rule? What learning analytics should we be collecting when we're dealing with virtual environments that are ubiquitous and can, can, can collect data that is just continuous, a continuous flow of data, right? So we get into issues of sampling. How much sampling do I have to do? How much data do I need? Um, so we can collect all kinds of uh, data. Can we coordinate, right? Because now I may not just have a metacognitive virtual room, right? In that room, I could also maybe have a cognitive agents. I can have affective agents, right? And then the question is, can we get them to articulate, right? Can get these students to articulate what they've learned so far. So, and if they articulate and reflect, what does multimodal data on reflection looks like? Okay. So a lot of uh, new in incredible uh, stories. In terms of real life application, we also work with medicine, right? So we just submitted a proposal to NSF. Uh, in this case, it's team performance and it's uh, about soft skills. Right. So thinking about multimodal data and learning analytics for soft skills. So imagine you have a, a COVID ward in a hospital setting, right? The patient has died. We pick up from ambient sensors, both on the each individual team member, but also uh, in the surroundings that the team is not being very empathetic. Right. What we're planning is, can we build a virtual environment where each of the team members have their own avatar? Right, but in the environment, we also have other intelligent virtual humans. We represent three here, just as an example, who are listening, hearing, and feeling, right? And can detect that these people are not being very empathetic given the death of a patient. The question then is, can we bring everyone together? So imagine the virtual humans jumping out and being part of the team and giving them training on emotion regulation skills that surround the delivery of bad news and empathy uh, to the family members. And here there's a lot of interest, especially in Florida. Uh, we're working with uh, a children's hospital where it's not only about that, but it's also about cultural differences. So we have, uh, as you know, we have a large Hispanic population, right? So how do we deal not only with the delivering of bad news, right, and empathy, but when you have to cross the cultural boundaries, 
right, and potentially linguistic boundaries. Other things that we're doing uh, is the digital twin, right? So if we, you know, in engineering, as you know, we have a lot, you know, there are a lot of digital twins. So we can have a digital twin of a car, you can have a digital twin of a plane, of a tank, uh, of, a, of a pump. But the question is, hey, how about we develop a virtual twin of a human? So imagine now a child being able to develop a human digital twin of herself. Here's this young girl, right? And this digital twin of you, the question becomes, what do we model in there, right? Is it their neural, their cognitive, their affective processes? Is it the personality, right? Their skills, right? And the question is then, can we, you know, can, because I'm a human, I have limitations. I have to go to bed. I have to eat. I have to sleep, right? But if my virtual twin lived in an immersive environment, before I go to sleep, I can tell it perhaps like, hey, remember that physics problem that I'm having a, a problem with? I want you while I'm sleeping, I want you to learn everything you can about how to solve this, including metacognitive skills. And then tomorrow morning, I want to interact with you and I want you to teach me what you learned because you don't need to sleep and you don't need to eat, et cetera, okay? So we're kind of uh, been working with some, trying to work with some gaming companies here in Orlando, right? So we can, you know, so that these humans actually look like us as, as much as possible. We're trying to figure out if we can use the Epic Games Meta Humans uh, toolkit to be able to do that, right? And then again, the question becomes, right? If this thing, if my digital twin learned from me, then what data, right, would it present, right? It's like, hey, you know, hey, Sammy, you know, you still do not have a good grasp on, you know, how to use cognitive strategies. Well, how do we translate that kind of feedback in terms of a learning analytic? What data visualization would we use? Uh, and then the other one that we're doing recently is a company that created this thing called Dr. Hologram. So it's literally, you can shoot a patient, right? In terms of video, and you can project that patient into here, there's a doctor, but here's the patient. Okay, so you can present the patient. It's full scale. They also have the smarter, the smaller version, and also the the um, the the mobile version. And so the question is, it's very, it's holographic, but it's very detailed. So what you see here are pictures that we actually, as we engage in this new project, and we're thinking about from telehealth, telemedicine perspective, is with my research team is we're trying to figure out how do these new technologies right, actually are impacting not only diagnostic reasoning and errors, but where would we put the, the multimodal data about how, here's one of my grad students, uh, if she was a clinician, right, what multimodal data would we present and where would we present it, right, in this environment to demonstrate to her that, you know, maybe, she, maybe this is a very complex case of this, of this patient, right, she's a medical student, we have physiological data that shows that she's highly aroused and she looks very confused because we have a camera, right? Pointing here and one here. And so the question is, can we take the multimodal data in real time and where would we project it in this environment so that she has a better understanding that she needs to regulate her physiology and her emotions because it's interfering with her ability to diagnose this case. So what I've put in the circles is to show you that you know, we're experimenting with eye tracking, the EDA, and then of course we have the output of what she's doing. This could actually be projected in the room because if you have medical students and faculty, it can also be, they can see her diagnostic process. So can we have almost like distributed multimodal learning uh, data being presented to the people in this context? Uh, uh, you probably, I don't know if you know, but, uh, we have the um, Space Force, which is, I guess, our fifth branch of the military now, thanks to our former president, uh, who's now created the Space Force. So we've had the Space Force come and talk to us. Uh, you know, it sounds like Star Trek, but I, 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 I'll, I'll stop laughing. Uh, so our Space Force, we have these guardians. So in terms of the digital twin, we're trying to figure out also if we can come up with digital twins of the guardians or the Space Force um, uh, soldiers, if you will. You know, the question becomes, you know, what, what, what are we modeling, right? And what are we simulating? And then how do we collect? So the bottom here is how do we collect this potentially multimodal data as they're performing different activities? And then can we create, if you will, an army 
of human digital twins that in real life, whether they're here on earth or if they're, let's say, on some planet or a space station, right? Uh, what data could these uh, versions of you, right? Give you so that you can enhance your performance and learning. Um, and yeah, so opportunities, I, I think that, you know, there are many barriers uh, that we still have, uh, you know, the multimodal learning analytics uh, community, as you know, is very active, it's, it's, it's growing, uh, it's extremely important. Uh, the nice thing is it brings so many dis dif different disciplines together, right, from psychology to statistics to engineering, computer science, and of course, all the stakeholders that we deal with, right. And so, but the question is, you know, what the opportunities and there's so much that we can still do. So what I wanted to do is actually present, you know, one scenario at least is can we optimize? We haven't talked really, you know, we don't see this in the, in the learning analytics uh, uh, community is can we optimize learning, right? Can there be better approaches to enhance our community by extending, not just describing what we see, right? And, and doing low level predictions, if you will, right? Of observable behaviors that are easy, like clickstream data, but when are we going to get to being able to take that same data and be able to explain and make predictive uh, organic optimization of more complex behaviors, right? When, for example, would a student be better at emotional regulation efficacy or be better at metacognitive monitoring their learning, right? So what would data visualizations from uh, a multimodal learning analytics allow us to project into the future? Right now, we're doing a lot of, hey, this is what you're doing now, right? Or it's post hoc. When are we gonna get for it to be intelligent enough to be able to project into the future? And if we could project that into the future, right? What does that look like, right? And then how do we, yeah, you can project, like if you continue with this kind of learning behavior, you're not gonna learn very much, let's say a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, that's good. But then what are the prescriptions? Like how do then I become better, right? So, those are some of the things that we're, we're you know, we, we, we've been uh, thinking about uh, that I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, and then the kind of lesson learned, lessons learned. Um, okay, this is just a few. So part of the problem is that self-regulation does take a lot of time, right? So if it takes weeks and months, that has implications for multimodal learning analytics, right? How, how much data do we need to collect, right? Before we present anyone with learning analytics. Um, things like multimodal data, right? How do we show the dynamics, right? Most of the representations that we tend to show in terms of learning analytics are very static representations, right? But if I'm trying to teach you about a process that you're not using very well, well, should we be showing static diagrams or, or representations? Uh, what are these, you know, how do we take the same data visualizations for our students and how do we re-represent that data for the different stakeholders? Should it be different for teachers or for parents, right? Or administrators, for example, when we think about school. And I think there's, you know, we have to do a better job, I think, as a community in terms of actually training teachers on how to interpret the data in terms of data analytics and work with them in terms of creating actionable learning analytics so that they're not sitting there looking at a data visualization from learning analytics tool and saying like, I, I don't understand what this is. I don't know what to do with this kind of data, right? And I think the other thing that we need to do that we're slowly merging is, you know, especially for more immersive virtual environments that, you know, thinking about AI, like how do we, like, can you imagine allowing a student to talk, talk quote unquote, to their own data visualizations? Right? Because it's one thing to present the learning analytics, but the question is, can I interrogate the data visualization of my learning processes that you're showing me? Right? Like you're showing me this histogram of my performance. I don't understand what I'm supposed to be taking from this. Right? Explain to me what this. Right. So, um, so those are some of the some of the lessons. Uh, and of course, we continue to work on conceptual and theoretical issues methodological issues, and of course, also the role of human and, and artificial agents uh, in terms of uh, in, in the future. Uh, and I think we also have to do a better job of not just focusing, it's easy to focus on the quantitative data, right? Because it's easy to collect and synthesize, et cetera. But what about qualitative changes that happen over time? How do we represent that in terms of learning analytics? And of course, you know, this work cannot be done. I mean, this is not me. This is a wonderful set of collaborators, both locally in the US and then in, 
you know, around the world, uh, everywhere from Portugal to Spain to the Netherlands to Germany, Finland, Israel, and et cetera. Um, so these are all wonderful collaborators. And, you know, I'm very much into uh, collaborating. You know, I love to collaborate. That's one of the rich uh, richness of, of this field and one of the, the pleasures of being an academic. Um, and I thank you for your attention. And, you know, if you have any questions, please let me know. And I guess uh, I will stop sharing now. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice presentation. Thank you much. Uh, so much uh, information. Great. Right, thank you. Uh, and if anyone in the audience has any question, Roy? Yeah. I'd like to ask a question, if that's possible. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was truly interesting, uh, really, really interesting. I appreciate it. Thanks on everything that you're putting together. You, so um, I, let, let me just very briefly share. Um, we are an advanced analytics company, and uh, we specialize in education. So we are an ed tech, um, and we have a learning analytics solution. One of the challenges that we have today, and I'll, I'll describe how it works. Basically, what we're doing is we're gathering the signals that the students are leaving behind, mostly on the LMS. Mm -hmm. um, and from the LMS, we, we put together a characterization based on a framework on uh, executive functions, social skills, uh, willingness to learn, and achievement. And, and once we have that characterization, we, um, we activate a bot to send nudges to the student in order to handhold them and give them tips and in order to increase. So one of the challenges that we're having today, and I'm guessing it's one of the challenges that you have, but just wanted to bounce that, is it's very hard to scale um, from one institution to another institution because, or even within the same institution, because there's not, there's not a standardized instructional design so the resources that are being used through the LMS are, I don't know, some, some faculty members use the quizzes and the forums and the discussions, and some faculty members don't use anything. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very hard to have a, a kind of a horizontal uh, approach. And then when you go from one institution to the other institution, you have to go through the same effort. Absolutely. Um, have you been able to crack this um, uniqueness on, on how to scale, how could you actually start gathering all the data that you're showing today, but yeah. systematically? Yeah, yeah. Miguel, I mean, that, that's, that's such a, a very pragmatic question. It's such a difficult question. I, I have to be honest, uh, as, a, as a faculty member, but research, from the research, as a research, when I put my research hat on, uh, that is one of the biggest struggles I have is to convince, you know, uh, either the university in terms of the LMS that they're using, or then how do we do uh, faculty training so they can take advantage of, you know, the features of the LMS. So at least they're all they're using and they know why they're going to be using these, right? But I think what, what, what happens is the, the novelty effect, right, in terms of even the lack of experience of using the LMS, right? Um, to, be, to be honest, for example, I myself, I, I, I don't use the LMS because, and I, I don't, like when, when we get pressure to teach online, it's like, no, 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 I want to be in classroom because of the, the human element. Uh, but the question, yeah, uh, it's, um, I, so I kind of feel your pain and I feel kind of powerless because just like you presented just now in terms of presenting your question, right? That, that's the same message that you keep telling administrators and faculty, but I, I feel powerless in terms of like, I cannot impose, like the, it's almost like the, the solution that you want, which is you should all be using this, you should all be using it this for this reason, et cetera, right? So, and, and so I don't know how, how else to tackle that problem, but you're right, because this is never gonna be a scalable, like what is a scalable solution if we don't get yeah. people on board, right? Yeah. What are your thoughts on 
of course, we, we want to gather as much information as possible without having to ask the subject, right? We, we, we just want to observe and, and be, be able to interpret. But what are your thoughts on just asking, just, just having standardized um, metacognitive questions um, through different moments and, and just using that to, to, to be able to understand how a kid or a student learns? Yeah, that, that would Miguel, that, that would be kind of a, that would be very easy to do, right? Because uh, and especially for example, when I think about the research that we've done, but of course other other researchers, right? We have very standard ways of actually doing those prompts. So like the meta tutor, right? You didn't see one, but there's Mary the monitor. She provides those prompts, right? So it'd be very easy to take the the existing measures that exist, both turning self reports in terms of uh, interventions, if you will, right? Metacognitive prompts. Uh, it can come from self-report measures, it can come from um, think aloud protocols, and also some of the theories that we have and models of metacognition. And it would be very easy to come up with a list, even if it's a list of, I would imagine it would probably be a list of about 30, right, different prompts that could then be delivered by a bot even, right, like you're saying. And then the question is also thinking about the timing given where the student is in terms of what they're doing uh, from a learning mm. perspective. That would be that would be a very that, compared to your first question that that one is that one is easier to tackle yeah yeah and I'm That's surprised like, I appreciate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Roger. Uh, we observed in the, in the in the presentation that you uh, show how you capture data from students, but one by one, uh, as far as we could see, uh, do you have any uh, project where you capture Information from the whole the whole uh, classroom. Uh, and how hard yeah. to do that? Yeah. So that was for our team, Hector. Uh, that would be the next step. Uh, so yes, we do one to one, and we can be one to one or small group in the classroom, or sometimes we pull them out of classroom. But you're right. Uh, the next thing that we want to do, especially with this uh, meta, uh, meta dash is to collect data from the entire classroom, right? And then be able to project that data. So that's kind of what we're working on right now. Part of, uh, part of the answer also to that question is kind of related to uh, Miguel's question is, you know, as researchers, we always are seen as outsiders coming into a classroom, yeah. right? Because we're not the teachers, right? And so uh, depending on who, you, who we work with, they sometimes also limit uh, our intrusion, if you will, into the classroom. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, but that's the next step. Yeah, because for example, based on your question, what, one thing I would love to do is, can we have a camera system in a classroom, right? And if you have 30 students in the classroom, right, can we collect the 30 facial expressions and analyze those facial expressions in real time, right? Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It could, yeah. Probably you guys, are you doing that? Are you doing that in terms of whole classroom uh, anal analytics? Uh, that's a... Uh, Roberto Ponce idea. Yeah. Capturing the, the the image all the all the classroom. Mm -hmm. But we were thinking about uh, using the bracelets and the, the eye tracking devices mm -hmm. and all this technology, but yeah. uh, you have the question how 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 hard could it be to have every student in a in a classroom for twenty students mm -hmm. uh, be possible probably because of the technology available at the, at the classroom, it will be too hard to, to compile all the information. Yeah. I mean, how, how difficult is that? So that, that could be a challenge. So that, yeah, so what you mentioned is, that, so the first challenge would be the financial challenge, right? Because, uh, so for example, uh, now that you mentioned that, so our colleagues in North Carolina collect, try to collect data using cheaper, so this is the problem. Cheaper eye trackers when they were, the kids were using okay, Crystal yeah. Island, right? So I think they collected like 20. They brought 20 of them in. So they're cheaper eye trackers. So the sampling rate is not that great. Uh, lots of errors. And then when we looked at the data, the data was so messy. And this is the other problem, right? Going into the classroom, right? The data is so messy. There's so many errors. There was almost like it's not worth, you know, because it, it's not it was not, at least for that ex example, it was not worth the, the effort, if you will, right? 
And then we had another caveat. I don't know if, if any of you have experienced this, is the company that we buy the eye tracking from, right, sometimes has in their clauses that we may or may not use that eye tracking for specific purposes. Mm. Right. Yeah. Because what we wanted to do is embed it within the game environment to create that loop, right? And they're like, no, we don't want that. You can use this as a research tool, but it cannot, you know, can't use a SDK to tap into the into the game. So, but that's another sure. issue, yeah. Uh, yeah, but doesn't mean that, so, so one question is, if we think about the future classroom, right, where we have a, a virtual classroom, right, would it be easier to collect data on all the kids in a virtual classroom? Probably, yeah. What are they doing? Are they moving? Uh, we have also a virtual campus at Academy of Monterrey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's another opportunity. Uh, we have a question on the on the chat oh. uh, from oh, Dr. Yeah. Sandra Florcanales. Uh, what do you consider to be the areas of opportunity for analytics in general? The areas of opportunity. Ah, um, huh. So um, that's a good question. Um, and, and Sandra, your, your question reminds me of the heavy focus that has been put on us, especially recently, not just with the new administration with uh, President Biden, uh, but the focus on workforce development, right? And so for data analytics, uh, there's a lot of interest, especially in, uh, in medicine. Right for healthcare training, and not just for physicians, right? But clinicians, uh, lab technicians, etc. There's a lot of work, and especially in the in the area of nursing, right? Uh, we know that uh, nursing, not just because of COVID. I mean, they're almost like teachers in that in that they get very low pay, right? But during COVID, uh, there's been a, a huge shortage of nurses. So uh, healthcare is actually one of the big. Um, areas that we think, and then the other is, and that's also gonna be, my answer is gonna be biased based on where we are, uh, is connecting to gaming companies. Gaming companies are very interested in bringing in the multimodal learning analytics and then the AI, et cetera. We're getting a lot of interest in, in collaborating uh, with them. So th those would be two, two areas. And of course, teaching, right? Yeah. Can't forget about the teachers. Sure. <laughs> uh, and, and, well, I, I guess a fourth one is, again, it's very situational is, um, and given the fact that, you know, uh, we have a war going on, right, in, in Ukraine, uh, is the heavy emphasis on uh, the military, right? But that's a whole nother, yeah, uh, the military is very interested in, uh, in, in analytics in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all these uh, uh, markets are, are looking for introducing this technology to to enhance their product, right? Mm -hmm. They are looking how to to use all this, but in the opposite way, for instance, uh, safe games. Uh, we have also observed there's a trend on, on that. Uh, do you see it as like an opportunity for for teaching uh, as high education using safe games? Did you, so wait, I'm sorry, did you say games and teaching? Uh, yes, uh, do you think that using serious games at higher education is an option? Huh, yeah, I, I, that's interesting. I think so, but I think there's, you know, anytime we talk about serious games and education here, you know, uh, the administrators don't really like that because it's like, it's almost they equate serious games where the kids are having fun, they're not learning. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's been a, that's been a real challenge, and also for some teachers in terms of their attitude, especially. Sorry, tend to be the older teachers, but um, I think I mean you know if we think about games, I mean if they're designed properly, right? Uh, in fact, they could you know really take a lot of uh, issues that we deal with in terms of motivation, right, and emotions, uh, and engagement, etc. I think it would solve a lot of problems, right? And we probably get a lot more engaged students who want to learn. And be in school, All right? So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and if we don't have more more uh, questions in the chat, uh, we can be closing. Uh, we invite you all to answer the, the survey that, that Gerardo has shared in the in the chat, and we will be sending the 
the recording for all of you and, and all the people that, that signed up for the for the seminar but could not attend. Uh, thank you very much, and Roger. And uh, we'll keep in touch, surely. Okay, absolutely. For, for yeah. In the discussion. Well, thank you so much, Hector and Geraldo. It was a pleasure being with you this morning, and thank you for the opportunity. And uh, looking forward to collaborating. Excellent. Me right. too. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Have a great, great weekend. Goodbye. Thank you, you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. You.